Well, what I'd like to do is sort of jump into the the kinds of work that we've been doing in Palau and in other parts of the world. And and in particular, what I what I sort of really want to talk to, to folks about is reefs like, like this one that are so beautiful and so diverse and so incredibly productive. This is one of the ones we work on in Palau. But this one's special because it's actually an incredibly heat resistant reef. It's something that we're hoping that we can find and study and replicate um, all all around the world. And and so that's that's what this talk is about. It's based in work that we have been doing in Palau and in Samoa and with a brand new consortium of exciting partners around the world uh, looking at, at heat resistance in corals. Ocean warming is a really big part of climate change um, and how coral reefs in particular react to that warming is an incredibly important part of how they survive in the future. Uh, so this is just some of the footage from the, the lab in um, Palau, the Palau International Coral Reef Center, where we just were until, until Till Monday uh, with a group of Stanford undergraduates. And it's the center of what I'm going to talk about, but it's also uh, the beginning, we think, of a much bigger kind of, of effort. So um, you know, this is a different view of, of Pickwick. Uh, coming through the rock islands towards it and this is a view of some of the folks that was who were with us in the last two weeks uh, brendan colwell on the upper left and and uh, marilla lippert on the bottom right in particular then set of undergrads that uh, we had along with us as interns and what we're doing here basically is we are using the facilities in palau um, to look at corals individually on the reef and understand, study, record, map their resistance to ocean warming and climate change efforts. And, and, and here's the, the basic reason. Um, this is a bleached coral. It's white. It's lost its symbionts uh, that give it, a lot of, give it a lot of its energy. Those symbionts uh, are expelled uh, when the ocean temperatures get a little bit too warm. Um, and that coral bleaching has caused huge problems in coral reefs all over the world, from the Great Barrier Reef, Caribbean, all through the Pacific Indian Ocean, everywhere. But the really fascinating and important thing is this. Right next to it, it on Palau's reefs, same species, different colony of the same kind of coral did not bleach. Um, it's obviously exposed to the same conditions. Obviously, it's the same kind of place. What makes that one resistant uh, on the left and not on the right? Um, that's with what's been motivating our research for the last, oh, 10 years or so. Um, the mechanisms involved, but more and more and more, uh, it's also been developing into, well, what do we use this asset for? Uh, how can we use it to help the future of reefs um, in Palau and, and all over the world? So we've built a testing facility at uh, the Palau Marine Lab. Uh, this is sort of us uh, two weeks ago putting it together there um, at Pickrick. Uh, the testing facility essentially allows us to control the conditions that a coral is under, simulate a heat wave, and then ask for individual corals how they respond uh, to, that, to that heat wave. And these are some of the results we, we can get. Um, on the top are five individual branches of individual corals, uh, five different corals. Um, and on the bottom are uh, replicate branches of those same corals. And the ones on the top were just put in our control tanks. They're just regular temperature. The ones on the bottom uh, went through a heat pulse, went through a heat wave. Uh, and they react uh, by either doing nothing, like the heat tolerant one on the left, or they react by completely losing their symbionts, and in some cases their tissue in, in, as well, like the one that's outlined there called heat sensitive. So that's what makes this a really powerful experimental system. You're taking corals, exposing them to a, a kind of stress they would see during a natural heat wave. Uh, you're doing it in an experimental, controlled, comparative way. And the results uh, can be compiled and you can find uh, heat sensitive corals, but we're re really looking for the heat tolerant one. Um, so kind of skip ahead a few years and, and many reefs and many, 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 many corals tested. And all these red dots on this map of Palau are locations where we have found and recorded heat uh, resistant corals. All throughout Palau, we can find them. Uh, so the good news there is that they're pretty common. Uh, they're widespread. Uh, 
Yet there are some places in Palau that have a much higher level of this heat resistance than than others. In particular, we can focus on this sort of zoom in on this area right in the sort of center on the, the left, the western the western coast that's outlined in red here. Uh, we call them the 20s because these reefs are numbered uh, 23 to uh, to 27 and and then in this little graph is the fraction of colonies in each of the areas outlined in this blue of uh, these blue or red or purple uh, lines um, the fraction that have shown heat resistance so we have two major areas the but by far the largest concentration of heat resistant corals is in this region the ha the amalik reefs it's in the amalik state in palau um, they're super reefs they're reefs where there are a lot of heat resistant corals and they are one of the foci of our research um, at this at this point um, we're also basically looking beyond just uh, well, the one species that was in this last, uh, the last figure. Um, this is just us booming out to, to a different sort of reef environment. Um, what we did over the last two weeks was to look at a set of different species. The basic simple question was, were the results from um, the one species that we had looked at before, are they replicable across uh, these different species? Um, and I promised the interns I'd show you data that they collected over the last two weeks. And so these are some of the, the bleaching results from five species. Um, the higher the bar, the, the more heat sensitive they are, the more bleaching they happen in our standard tanks. And the red bars are a northern lagoon reef, a control reef that has pretty much a lot of bleaching. And then these Amalik super reef sites are in the blue. And what you can see across these five species, three of them are stronger in the Amalik reef sites. Um, two of them are, are about are, are a little bit stronger, actually, um, outside the Amalik site. But uh, the essentially the more heat sensitive colonies, the ones that are more sensitive to climate change and heat waves, they're much stronger in these Amalik super reef sites because the bar is lower, there's less bleaching in those colonies than, than the others. Uh, so that gives us pretty good confidence that uh, A, we found a good super reef location, the Amalik reefs, that it applies to um, at least uh, a suite of species that are there um, and that uh, they and other concentrations of heat resistant corals like them, uh, you know, are good candidates for our, our scrutiny. Uh, just to give you an idea where they are, we're going to zoom into those Amalik reef sites as it's sort of dropping in on Google Earth toward these, these patch reefs in, in Palau in the back reef lagoon in this area on the western side of, of the island. Um, but it, we wanted to do really more than that. Uh, because you know you, you really only uh, love what you know and you really only want to protect what you love, sort of the famous John Muir statement. And these are the reefs of Emily. This is one of the patch reefs here. Uh, this is our small collecting boat that came from Pickrick and that uh, we basically positioned it over the reef. That's sort of us going out, um, surveying the corals that we've mapped and marked. And what you find when you jump into these areas is, is an incredible diversity and incredible life of corals in this, in this area. So remember, these are heat resistant reefs. Uh, many of the species that you're seeing, actually most of the species you're seeing right now, we've tested uh, to, and, and can show are very heat resistant. Um, we see lots of fish, we see lots of different corals, we see lots of different types of diversity. That, that really is the hallmark of how coral reefs are, are functioning in the world. The kinds of things that drive uh, tourist density, the kinds of things that build reefs to protect shorelines, the kinds of of corals that, that attract fish for, um, for fisheries and for livelihoods. So, uh, so we've been showing these pictures around Palau and in other areas just to give people an idea of what they might be protecting if they were protecting these, these super reefs. So um, I just moved really quickly through these ideas of, of heat resistance and how to find them in our mapping studies. And I've left out a lot of the genetics we do in the physiology and um, and the ecological mapping because I really want to come down to these kind of questions. Uh, what can you do with these, these heat resistant uh, 
corals. It's one thing to find them, but we're really focused on the, the, the practicality of knowing where they are. Um, and so you can do you know, two major things. One of them is to use them to restore reefs uh, with heat resistant colonies because you know, you know where they are. Um, and you can also protect these reefs in the future. And both of those are major tools in ocean conservation. Marine protected area creation and, and reef restoration are sort of the two of the major kinds of can-do tools in coral reefs. Um, they are not designed necessarily to give you climate resistant products. And so what we're doing with this is designing a way of melding these tools with this new approach um, to allow us to do protection and restoration with climate resistant products. So that has actually meshed really well with a set of other collaborators that we've joined forces with over the last year or two uh, and, and created uh, a brand, uh, an idea, a, a movement called Super Reefs. It's sustaining coral ecosystems in a changing ocean by focusing on the corals that have the best chance of surviving and thriving in the next uh, couple of decades. And it has a bunch of different components. And one from Woods Hole Oceanographic is, is deep, high uh, resolution oceanographic modeling that tells us where we would expect the water to be warmest. Turns out those Amelie super reefs have, have warmer water around them because of current flow. So the models that Ann Cohen's group at Woods Hole can produce can, can show us where we can predict what they would be. Uh, all, and, and so we can go there. That's the predict part. Then uh, the prove part is us using our, our um, coral reef stress tanks uh, like shown here, along with Victor Nestor, who's one of our major collaborators at, in Palau, to test those corals, uh, to find out which ones really are heat resistant, um, given the models, uh, and then take them, put them in coral nurseries, that's shown in the middle there, um, and be able to prove that in fact they still are heat resistant, that they can grow, and that they're a good, a good candidate for the, the grow out nursery uh, kind of Kind of thing. So this, the Super Reefs Consortium um, includes the modeling and the testing and then a lot of community engagement that's run by the Nature Conservancy in particular, because all of this doesn't matter uh, if only a few scientists from Stanford know about it. It really matters if in fact the local communities who are there and can use the tools, know about them, and actually know how to use them. And the best circumstances when they come to us and say, could you please come out here and tell us where the, where the super reefs are because we really want to start on protecting our reefs. And that's, that's kind of the excitement of this is when that, that's beginning um, to happen. So I've sort of already described what our role in all this is um, and, and how we're moving about it. Um, but there's a little, there's, there's, there's a pause here because the science of corals and the science of heat resistance tells us that there's some important mechanisms that we have to take advantage of and understand. Um, because if, to use these corals and to make that protection practical, then you need to know something. Um, because there's three ways corals can be heat resistant. And one of them is that they can acclimate to warmer water. They, their physiology can adjust uh, to make them more heat resistant in warmer, warmer water, just like our physiology can adjust to, to say, lower oxygen uh, levels in Denver. We can do that. Our bodies do that. And in a couple of months, corals can do that, too, with warmer water. Um, they can also have a more heat resistant symbiont. That, that symbiont they expel during bleaching can be heat resistant, and heat resistant symbionts reduce bleaching. Um, or they could have heat resistant coral genes. It could be the coral itself and how it interacts with its symbionts and its environment that is intrinsically heat resistant. And, and the reason why they're important to know which one of these is going on is because the first two are temporary. You move a coral to a cool, uh, cooler area, it loses its heat resistance. If you move a coral to a cooler area, it will generally lose its heat resistant symbiont and pick up a heat, um, heat sensitive symbiont. Um, it's only the heat resistant coral genes that actually are a permanent heat resistance. And so that durable heat resistance is really important to what we're trying to do. And that's the thing we have to try to understand from a scientific basis. So we sort of ran our heads around that issue to say, well, how are we going to basically separate these? There's lots of very complicated ways of doing it. But we came back to a really simple kind of experimental procedure that, that's known in forestry, it's known in agriculture, it's called a common garden experiment. Grow things together 
And the differences between them after they've grown together are really intrinsic and durable parts of what it is that they, they do. So we started making very small t uh, experimental nurseries. Uh, this is Victor uh, shown with our really highly sophisticated way of putting in the rebar necessary um, to, to set up coral nurseries. We are all involved in this at some point, basically down there pounding the rebar into the reef. Um, the good thing about it, though, is that it's, it's very inexpensive to do, and it can be done almost, almost anywhere. And what happens uh, when we're done, um, we have panels that we can attach with cable ties to the reefs, the corals that are growing in the nursery attached to the panels. This is, this is one of our uh, undergrad interns who was really a fabulous photographer, just basically taking shots of some of our common garden experiments. And then on the right, Upper right, Katrina Armstrong, who hopefully has uh, in the webinar, um, who's been in, uh, really a, a fabulously uh, great point uh, researcher in establishing all these. Um, we can ba basically then uh, set up these tests, uh, can grow them up and show a, a which ones are successful, but also which ones remain um, heat resistant. So I, I just can't help showing you this uh, because these are very successful ways of growing corals. Um, this is one rack that we put out about a year and a half ago, showing it to you in October last year, and then two weeks ago in July, um, uh, what it was what it was like there. These corals are basically um, growing incredibly well. They're ready to be put back on the reef if that's what that's what someone decided and that that's what they they wanted to do. Now, COVID hit because uh, we set up these experiments a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, we're all ready to go. We couldn't go back to Palau um, because of, of COVID. And yeah, you know, we still have researchers and students there from the Palau Community College. And so we started doing a, a, a whole process of online remote mentoring. This is Victor. During one of our many COVID talks, we would talk two, three, four times a week about the experiments and how to do them, where to get them. And what we discovered was that because of um, because of Zoom and WhatsApp in particular, we could really be in close touch with the researchers in the in the field once they knew what what how to use the equipment. Um, we could troubleshoot. We could help them design the experiments. We could we could sort of walk through that with them. And and Victor and his students there did over eighteen hundred experiments um, during COVID on the the racks that Katrina and all of us set out. Uh, and it, it showed us that, in fact, it was quite possible to have this work done, not just by us, but by a consortium of people in, in real life places all over the world. Um, we found out uh, the things that we were trying, trying to, um, for example, this uh, sort of some data on the bleaching propensity of corals at two different locations. So uh, these are nurseries that we set up at uh, Patch Reef number uh, 21 and Patch Reef 27. These are the same coral colonies split and grown in two different places. And what's shown here are the visual bleaching scores uh, for these corals after, um, after Victor ran those experiments and um, transmitted us the, uh, the results. And a low bleaching score means that it didn't really bleach. One means no bleaching. Five means total bleaching. And what's shown here is the results from a colony uh, at reef 21 and the same colony at reef 27. And what you can see here is that there are some colonies, like the ones that are, are surrounded in red, that had high bleaching at both reefs. They're essentially not heat resistant. They're not heat resistant in both places. Um, whereas the ones in green are the low bleaching colonies. They have no or just visible bleaching um, at both reefs, meaning that in these two different environments, they, they show high levels of uh, heat resistance. And it, it shows us that these colonies are the ones that we would be focusing on if we were going to do a restoration project. We would say, well, these, uh, in this case, seven dots represent seven different colonies that have durable heat resistance, then we can move forward with with using them. So we've got lots of data like this. This just gives you an idea how we collect the data and how we sort how we sort through it. Um, we also have a have developed because of COVID really um, a, a different way of dealing with the data. Essentially a rem 
remote access to the data becomes more and more important, especially if you have experiments going on all over the world. And these, these are pictures taken by Victor of some of the experiments. They, these are all fragments of corals that he clipped off of the, um, the nurseries. The dark ones here are corals that survived uh, really the bleaching experiment. They didn't have much bleaching. They're essentially the heat resistant ones. The ones that are that are tan or white are ones that bleached quite a bit at the same under the same conditions. So uh, we have <laughs> we have hundreds of these photographs from thousands of coral fragments. Uh, we can go through them and do a visual bleaching score. Um, but some of the uh, the interns this summer um, actually spent a great deal of time learning how to digitize these images. Essentially, they sat down and they put little coordinates over each of these colonies, used image J to get the hue, the color density of these particular corals, and then used the standardized color card in order to be able to standardize from one experiment to another. And what that showed us was that not only could we go ahead and and do a visual score of the bleaching very quickly. But from the photographs that, that Victor and his students already uploaded onto our Google Drive, we have a record of these experiments that is highly quantitative and is highly replicable. So that's a huge benefit uh, to this kind of research um, because not only can you do the experiments in a remote locations, but, but essentially the world has access to the data and you can, you can build um, we build consortiums uh, building access to those data sets. So where are we? Um, we've learned a lot about heat resistant corals uh, in this research. We know, we know how to find them. Um, we find them by testing them. Um, we've test them in the coral reef tanks that I, that I showed you. Uh, we know how to grow them. Uh, we know how to grow them simply and we know how to, um, to transplant them. Um, and all that has been done uh, at, at the, the Palau International Coral Reef Center. Um, we've done it in other places as well, but most of the time they're fairly large infrastructure places. Uh, the real question then is scalability. Can you scale this up into places that don't have a PICRIC or a lab or running seawater system? How can you do this outside of a, of a big lab? Do you need a boat that you can bring in and have all that stuff? Are you, you know, do you have to fly in a whole bunch of stuff? So what we have been trying to do is to take this concept and um, the way it fits into the super reefs kind of world and figure out a way to make it more democratized, to figure out a way to make it able to be used um, in many different places around, around the world. Um, and so this is kind of where we are with that. This is uh, a, a, a new system that we developed. It actually represents a pretty good uh, <laughs> return to our first type of system that we built years and years ago. This one essentially is very portable. It's what we call the on the beach version of of this system. It runs just any place you can get power to. It's running off of a very simple controller. It doesn't have a fancy flow through water system. It has a bucket and a siphon. Um, and uh, we set this up in Palau, set it up right, uh, right beside the more sort of fancy ones we have. And it works really well. Um, it, it takes more care. You have to be there, you know, kind of managing it. You can't walk away from it like we can walk away from our computer controlled ones. Um, but it, it allows us the same kind of standardized comparable tests of coral uh, heat resistance that we had elsewhere. Um, so this basically gives us the opportunity uh, to look at the world, uh, the reef world, a bit, a bit differently. Um, we can also then uh, simplify the nursery components. Uh, I showed you um, a little bit about that uh, before. Um, I'll cut that sound. Uh, this is just some of the video of some of the, the reef racks that we put in in some of the uh, some of the reefs. Essentially they are made out of rebar, cable ties, a plastic mesh, uh, and corals that are that are either cable tied or, or cemented down to it. So uh, con construction materials that are very common in the tropical world. They cost about a, maybe $2 per rack. Uh, the racks last for years. They take very little maintenance. And so again, a cost effective way of allowing communities to do this kind of project without a lot of, of infrastructure. 
Um, one of my colleagues in bioengineering, Manu Prakash, uh, calls this frugal science. It's essentially being able to do the best science you can do at a very low cost. And that makes it possible to, to, to again, democratize it, get it into the hands of the people that, that, really, that really need it. Um, then there's the data. I think I described that already. Uh, this is Victor, and again, uh, who could take the photos and upload them to our Google Drive and allow us to remote access them. And then with the new image J kind of uh, procedures that I told you about, then uh, we can essentially make sure the data themselves are captured and compared. Um, and that leads us to an exciting possibility of having people from all, all over the world simultaneously doing experiments, uploading the data, having them analyzed remotely uh, in a consortium, and then having conversations around uh, people about the data, what they mean, um, and, and then essentially allow the analysis itself to be part of this global process uh, that we're, we're hoping to, to, to spark. So, um, you know, what, I, what I've tried to do in, in this is to give, give you an idea of um, a couple of important things. A, that there is variation in heat resistance out there on current reefs, that uh, there is the ability for corals there to survive more of climate change uh, than right now. Um, that variation is widespread. Uh, we can identify where it's likely to be most common um, and we can target those areas for protection and for use in, in restoration projects in, in the future. That is not going to solve the problems that coral reefs have right now in the face of climate change. It has to go along with things like reducing CO2 emissions around the world. Um, it has to go along with reducing other pressures on reefs like pollution and, and, and overfishing, etc. Um, but it gives us a chance because even if we do reduce CO2 emissions, I mean, even when we reduce CO2 emissions, we're still faced with decades of climate change as our accumulated bolus of CO2 works its way out of the system. And, you know, what's our job? Our job as a coral reef scientist is you know, not to be able to reduce CO2 emissions around the world. I mean, part of the part of the new role of the new sustainability school is to harness the power of the engineering section and the energy sector to be able to do um, to do a lot of that. And we're all all for that. But we all have a role, too, and that is to preserve as much as possible over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years so that when things do get better and they will get better, there is coral reefs to grow back from. And, and that's really our mission, I think, and the kinds of thing that motivates this, this type of reverse work. It, it motivates the Super Reefs project, and it motivates the ability or the, the hope to get this resource out to as many different places as possible so that we can right now start this process of saving as much as we can in as many places as, as we possibly can. So, um, I try to go pretty fast in order to have time for questions and comments. I would love to hear from folks about, you know, your experiences, what you think about about this, what you would do with these tools, how you would improve them would be even even better because um, it's an ongoing process. Um, and then I actually wanted to return to Palau. This is one of my favorite photos from of the of Pickrick from the Dawn office. I call it uh, there. Um, just as the sun is coming up at about 6.10 a.m. Um, we couldn't do this work without the support of the people of Palau. Uh, these are not our reefs. These are not our coasts. Um, uh, the, the people from all these different states and the national government have been incredibly generous in allowing us access to their reefs. Uh, we've worked with uh, Victor and students at the Palau Community College, um, not only to train them in what it is that we can teach, but also learn from them about their history and the kinds of way that their culture uses those reefs. So we feel really fortunate about having these partners that allow us to, to not only study and learn, but hopefully return something as well. And um, even though Pickrick is, you know, a great lab, one of the most advanced and you know well-equipped labs in, in all of the Western Pacific. Um, what we're hoping to do is be able to do this in other places and return this kind of science and community together uh, into action, um, not only in, in Palau, but places all, all over the world. So that's what I kind of wanted to tee up and, and talk about. Um, so I'll sort of turn this back over to Ria 
uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Steve, for that incredible presentation. Um, I'm gonna jump right into questions. We have plenty of them. Uh, we have a question from Karen that says, as you move heat resistant corals to reefs that have been bleached to restore those reefs, how do you avoid the potential problem of introducing invasive species that are detrimental to the rest of the receiving reefs ecosystem? Cool, that is such a great question. And it's a really important one. Um, and, and the answer is that what you wanna do is do any of this very locally. So for example, when we move corals around, we have moved them at most about 10 miles in Palau, just within the same lagoon. And um, coral reef biologists that we, uh, we surveyed in a, in a program that I, I ran for the National Academies of Science, um, we, we, we asked that question. And, and for, for others, what the problem is, what, what, the, what the question is all about is that when you move a coral, you are moving the coral, but everything else that's living in that coral, and it's thousands of things, it's thousands of microbes, it's little worms, it's algae within the colony itself, it's stuff that is burrowed into the skeleton. And if you move it, you're risking the community you're moving that into um, because they that community might not have any defenses against a really invasive alga or a big invasive microbe. Um, so we ask coral reef biologists, you know, around the world, okay, what do you, you know, is this a problem? Yes, everyone says it's a problem. So is it a problem if you move a coral a mile or a kilometer we did? Uh, it's like, no, it, suppose you move them a thousand kilometers. Everyone says, yes, you, that's a huge problem. And so we kind of came back, how about 10 miles? Mm, yeah, that's probably okay, or 10 kilometers. How about a hundred kilometers? And then people started getting worried about it. So um, the, the question is exactly on track. Keeping it local is the answer. And that's why our on the beach reef tanks really are the solution, because you can't do this work, say, in Palau and then apply it to an atoll, say, um, Yap is 800 miles away, and then fly your heat resistant corals to Yap. No, 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 no. Cannot do that. You have to go to Yap and actually do it there. We have a question here from Adam. Does ocean acidification play a role here along with the heat? Yeah, Adam, it does. Um, ocean acidification, by reducing um, the sort of the pH, causes coral growth to slow, causes coral calcification to be more energetically, more costly. And so um, the corals themselves are a little bit more fragile and a little bit slower. But that, so that is a problem. And um, frankly, if we don't get a handle on CO2 emissions over the next century, CO2 levels are gonna reach to the point where virtually all corals will be hugely affected by that problem. But it's not a problem right now. It's not killing corals right now. Bleaching is killing corals right now. And so uh, our, our first effort is to basically solve the bleaching problem, because that is going to be a problem, even if we get a, a handle on CO2 emissions, it's going to be a problem for decades. And then hope that by the process of us solving the CO2 problem, that uh, the acidification won't raise its ugly head. But you're, you're, you're completely right. There are cases of people worried about the, the combination being a little bit more deadly, that is, acidification is more a problem when the oceans are warmer. And, you know, people are looking, looking into that as well. But our, our kind of focus is really triage on the, the key thing that is really killing them right now. Yeah, um, we have a question from Wayne. Um, he has a trip scheduled to the Great Barrier Reef in January. He's wondering if it's still dying or have conditions improved. Well, Wayne, you should still go to the Great Barrier Reef, right? <laughs> hey, um, by all means. Uh, no, it is not still dying. The, the reef problem that they had came in a, a double whammy kind of set of years, uh, 2016 and 17, which were global coral bleaching years. Um, and the Great Barrier Reef has been one of the areas that has been monitored 
to a huge degree. So we know a lot about how bleaching has affected um, the Great Barrier Reef and whole and in large areas were. Recovery is ongoing there because reefs do recover from, uh, from these. And in fact, some of my colleagues there in Australia at the Australian Institute of Marine Science have been trying to document whether or not the natural process of, of um, survival of heat resistant corals is leading to the, the unnatural process of sort of revival of reefs with those particular corals. Um, they're also in a process of doing just what I've described in terms of trying to learn how to replant uh, heat resistant corals and, and all of that. So um, if you look at the Great Barrier Reef uh, Foundation website, you will find the current data on coral cover in the, on the Great Barrier Reef. And you'll find that in 2020, 2021, that coral cover is starting to come back up again after the, the bleaching from before. And the areas I know, people that have been the Great Barrier Reef since then, um, it's utterly enjoyable and utterly fascinating. Um, you know, maybe if you had gone 100 years ago, it would have probably been a little bit more fascinating. <laughs> um, but part of the value in coral reefs right now is that we still have a lot. And it's really an ecosystem we're saving. We have a question from D. Paul. Do you have any thoughts on what conditions might be leading to the heat resistant strains? Oh, yeah. Thanks, D. The, um, I think it's because these corals uh, live in a highly variable environment. And there are some places that are warmer and more extreme than others. Uh, for example, at a low tide in the middle of the day, in these Palau reefs, uh, we have th thermal sensor recorders that can record the temperature. And you see this huge bump in temperature. It's usually 30 degrees. It might go up to 35, 36, even 37 degrees um, in these areas just for the day. And our coral reef tanks are designed to mimic those, those pulses. So um, those areas are filters. They allow corals that have the capacity to be heat resistant to live there. And, uh, and, and they don't allow too many of the corals that are heat sensitive to live there. And, with them, and within the population itself, there's a lot of genetic diversity for that trait. So what you have is this case of Darwinian selection. In a hot reef, you, so you're selecting for the corals that are heat resistant. And those are heat resistant corals that are doing better right there. So I think it's kind of a natural filter that allows these corals to accumulate and survive. And what I find, you know, pretty encouraging is that we have found that everywhere, everywhere we have looked, we have found places that have these higher levels of heat resistant corals. And that's, that's what kind of gives me the zoom to, 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 to look for them in other places, um, to be part of this super reef consortium, and then um, try to use this, these tools all in, in every different setting we can um, to identify those places. We have a question from Sharmila. Do you worry that transplanting a few corals widely will reduce species diversity? Yeah, this, these are great questions. I mean, it's all, it's almost like, you know, you've taken the course in, <laughs> in coral uh, restoration biology. Yes, we do worry about that a huge amount. Um, you know, because if, if you plant one genotype of corals all over, well, that genotype may not be resistant, say, to disease or to acidification or cold or something like that. So you really do need to have a high level of genetic diversity that's out there. And that's why we went pretty broadly to look for heat resistant corals in lots of different areas to see what the inventory was. Um, and if there's only one or two heat resistant corals in all of Palau, then we're in trouble because we don't want to replicate just them. But if we replicate a, a wide variety of them, then we not only have that trait, but we build in the genetic diversity that's a resource for the future. Because we really don't know what the next problem is going to be. We really don't know some of the downsides of heat resistance in some corals. So we have to play it safe. And, and one way to do that is to keep the genetic diversity up. The, the other aspect of that was the species diversity. And we tend to work on one species in particular because it's very common and it grows quickly. 
but our our movement towards multiple species basically multiplies the problem by whatever you know five or a ten or or a hundred fold um, and there we want to keep species diversity up uh, because different species plays different roles and that means having heat resistant corals in lots of different species awesome um we have a question from michael are you finding significant quantities of heat resistant corals on the Great Barrier Reef, the Maldives, et cetera, or is Palau unique? Palau is not unique as far as we can tell. Um, colleagues of mine have been working on the Great Barrier Reef and discovering um, heat resistant corals there. In fact, they have, they have a system very similar to the one that I showed you. Uh, it's, it's based on a ship. They drive it around the Great Barrier Reef and test corals. Um, and are, are finding heat resistant corals that way. Um, I don't know of anyone who's done this work yet in the Maldives, uh, for example, all for it, let me know. Um, uh, Kali, uh, we've done this in American Samoa, we've done this um, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, other colleagues have done this in the Red Sea and in Hawaii. Uh, the Super East project is hoping to, to, to jumpstart this kind of thing in a different atolls and the Marshall Islands in Hawaii, in the Caribbean, um, and in the, in the Philippines, I mean, in the, in Indonesia. So, uh, everywhere we can, everywhere where anyone has gone and looked, they found these different levels for sure. Um, but we haven't been everywhere yet. We have a question from Caleb. How do you identify heat resistance in the wild? Is it something, is it, is it that some of the neighboring corals bleached while others did not? Or is it that water temperatures were high and the coral in that area didn't bleach? Yeah, both of those are true. And so people will do surveys of corals during bleaching events and then going back and saying, well, here's the corals that survived the bleaching event. They must be heat, heat resistant, um, for example. Um, you have to be a little careful because there are microclimates on reefs, and so some corals might be in a little bit of a of a of a you know current zone that keeps the the heat from getting too high uh, for them. Um, but that is one of the ways that that people have tried to do that. Uh, what we've tried to do is not wait for the bleaching event to happen um, and bring in corals to to test them. Uh, physiologically. Now we don't bring the whole coral in. I mean, they're, they're, they tend to be big critters uh, and we take a small piece, test it. Uh, all the corals that we have worked on are tagged and we know the GPS coordinates so we can go back to them and, uh, and find out who, you know, who they are. Um, we actually have done the full genomes of about 290 of them. And so we know a lot about the genetics of these colonies, how it changes from place to place and time to time. Uh, we've even found coral cousins, you know, really closely related corals that are, for the first time, as far as I know, anywhere in the world, we found corals that are closely related by either sharing, by being cousins. Um, actually, we have a few half sibs um, that, that we found. Um, and that I don't know what that means, but just it, it just makes me smile. <laughs> makes me smile too. It's so fascinating. Um, we have a question from David. Were the warming temperatures in Palau, for which you tested coral heat resistance, representative of the more extreme temperature increases elsewhere in the world? Um, if I you cut out for a second there, but could you repeat that? I should be easier. Yeah. Were the warming temperatures in Palau, for which you tested coral heat resistance, representative of the more extreme temperature increases elsewhere in the world? Pretty much. You know, um, temperatures on a, on, a, on a reef are very idiosyncratic. They depend upon the, the depth and the water motion and um, tides and, and all of that. So we've compared that pretty carefully in American Samoa, where we worked for a long time in Palau. Uh, and the Palau reefs tend to be a bit more, or actually quite a bit more resistant uh, than the Samoan reefs were. Um, yet the extremes are, tend to be about, about the same. So what the warm, warming conditions that cause corals 
to be heat resistant in Samoa are pretty similar to the conditions that cause them to be heat resistant in, in Palau. But it's going to be a little different in different places. So for example, Hawaii. Hawaii is pretty far north of the equator. The uh, winter temperatures are cool. The summer temperatures are, are not too hot. And so what bleaches a coral in Hawaii is about 30 degrees centigrade. But the corals in Palau are normally living at 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, and it takes about 34 degrees for them to bleach. So depending upon where you live in the world, if you're a coral, uh, the bleaching temperature is a little bit different. The warmer the normal weather, the normal the wor normal water, the higher the bleaching temperature temp typically is. We have a question from Pat. Uh, they have read about projects to transplant heat resistant corals to areas where coral reefs are dying. What are the pluses and minuses of doing this? Great. I mean, the, the, the pluses, of course, are that you're expanding the range of these heat resistant corals and that, and that uh, you're, you're potentially increasing the places that, that they can grow. Um, just knowing what you just said, if I only knew that, the minuses are, I don't know what killed those corals. So if what killed them is still there, there's no point in me putting any more in there because they're just going to die of that instead. Um, I also don't know just from that um, uh, how far away it is and so what the problems are with, with uh, the translocation and the invasion stuff that we talked about, about earlier. Um, and, um, and I don't know whether that particular reef t tends to be uh, a place that has a lot of warm water already um, or what, what its conditions are. So, so what we try to do when we're, when we're looking at these kind of restoration projects is to say, okay, what's the future of that place? In terms of heat. So the oceanographic models that Ann Cohen's group runs can also be tuned into the future. And so if we can say, okay, if we're going to do a restoration project here, is this going to turn into like some boiling cauldron of hot water in, in, 19, in 2050? Maybe that's not a good spot, um, uh, even for heat resistant corals. But if it's, maybe it's going to be a place that is moderately warm, or maybe it's going to warm like everything else. So, um, we can use those models to try to get an idea what what the future is going to be like for them and then we also go back and ask what killed them and if the local community wants to protect those reefs then they'll also be willing oftentimes to protect them against say the overfishing or the dumping or the pollution or the sedimentation that has killed them to begin with we have a question from knight Will you be able to distinguish the DNA of heat resistant coral from non heat resistant corals? You know, that is like the holy grail um, uh, of all of this, like a little, a little, you know, 23 and me test and, and boom, you, you know that you're, you're heat resistant. And we've been on that trail for about a decade. Uh, lots of other people have as well. And what we've discovered is that, um, there are many genes that confer a little bit of heat resistance. So we think that the trait is, it's called a multi-locus trait. It's like human height. It's genetic, but a human height is based upon about four to five, maybe even 600 genes all acting. And your, your height depends on how many of those tall genes you got from your two parents. And so, Tall parents can have, you know, shorter kids, shorter parents can have taller kids, uh, but you can't find the gene that does it. So that is kind of the situation we think for corals. Then you have to, you have to add to that the fact we're not talking about one, one species, but dozens or, you know, 50 species. And there's no way there's going to all be the same genetics for that. So there's some genes we know are really important and we're kind of following that see what we know um, but so far we haven't come up with a single genetic test that can say this is a heat tolerant coral um, and then i asked myself suppose there was now if i could do that test right 
in situ, if I could get a sample of a coral and do the test right there, then that might help. But if I have to take the sample and get the DNA and send it to the lab and get them to do it and send it back, by the time that happens, I can use my tanks and I can find out. So you know, that's, <laughs> that's kind of where we are with this is like, you know, trying to balance the different levels of technology to get the best answer the fastest. Awesome. We have a question from Marli Marilda. Um, she's, they are an avid recreational scuba diver, recently retired and have traveled globally to dive. What can we do to help? And are there any coral preservation centers that need volunteers? Great, great question. Um, I think one of the things to help is to keep diving, keep going around the world and keep, <laughs> keep enjoying it, keep telling people, keep keep being involved in, in how these communities actually are thriving. Um, if you can, you know, be a little bold and go into sort of the, the more re remote areas where, um, you know, it's it, local people doing dive, you know, doing dives and dive industries to sort of see what it's like to be, to live in a small atoll someplace or, or just be there. Uh, for for a bit, um, Stanford alumni have a great cruise of Micronesia, for example, that can can let you dive in you know ten different atolls in in Micronesia. Um, the the other thing is to honestly you know keep up the conversation that CO two emission has got to stop, and that that is the future of all of us. And along the way, efforts to keep things going are really important. Not just coral reefs, but forests, grasslands, you know, the tropical rainforests, seagrass beds, everywhere is facing the same sort of thing. So all of us realizing that we have a role in protecting as much as possible into the future. Uh, so we can grow back and so our kids and grandkids can enjoy it. You know, that that's all part of our like that should be part of our, our lives. We have time for a, few, a couple more questions. Uh, we have a question from Marilyn. If you are able to repopulate other areas with the heat resistant coral, how does that affect the life that lives on those corals? Can the life exist in the area where the heat resistant coral will be placed to continue to live and be compatible with the imported coral? Yeah, again, we're, it, this, is, this is a great question. It's kind of based on uh, the answer is kind of based upon it all being local um, and that because it's local and because you haven't moved them very far, the same kind of fish and invertebrate communities that would be on those corals in one place will be there for the other place. So, you know, in Palau are two kinds of reefs, the, the Amalik super reefs and then the northern reefs that are different. They're only seven miles from one another. So the, the community of fish is the same. They're all available for, for all those things. Um, then the other thing is the species diversity. If you just planted one kind of coral, then a lot of the species that liked that coral would be fine, but other species that needed something else wouldn't. So again, the diversity of corals is, is there. Um, I kind of have to say though, I mean, in all this, uh, I've sort of been very optimistic and like ebullient about it um, because I do feel like we have a good a good way forward. It's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> it's going to be hard to do and consistently hard to keep going. Um, it's just that we've never really had the ability to do anything like this before. And the scalability has always been the problem. And I think we're, we're getting close to solving that with this frugal science approach coupled with the modeling and the community engagement is this sweet spot, I think, of possibility. It's still going to be a lot of work. And I don't, I don't want to just be glib about it, but it's, but it's possible. And the work can be done locally by local people. It doesn't have to be, you know, scientists flying in and, and doing it. And that makes all the difference because local people tend to really see the value of their environment and their legacy into the future. And yeah, it's a lot of work. We have to help them. And we have time for one more question from our newly formed alumni group, Stanford Alumni and Sustainability. What's next on the horizon for you in terms of ocean research and conservation? Oh, 
Great, <clears throat> great question. Uh, I'm joining the sustainability school. At least, at least um, half my position will go there. My other position will stay in biology because the genetics we do really ties me into all that. Um, I have great colleagues there who are really opening my eyes to a wide variety of different kind of things. So what are we doing? We're pushing the, the Super Reefs project as fast as we can. We want to go to Montero and take this. Uh, the folks in Palau are now asking us to take the on the beach tanks and spread them out, bring them to different communities and let those communities do the test, which I think is essentially fabulous and, and really anxious to do. Um, we have interest in taking the Super East projects to the Caribbean, to Hawaii, to, to Indonesia. Um, I have to say we're also working locally. I'm based in Monterey. And so the same kind of sentiment is also applicable to our coast and our, our kelp forest here. I haven't been talking about that, um, but we have been working with the Chumash um, tribal group just south of Monterey between us and Santa Barbara on their interest in the sustainability and the diversity of our coast in the, in the face of climate change. And, um, and that's another whole area of research I'd love to talk about in a different time maybe, but um, looking at the diversity of the coast through this cultural lens we have right at our doorstep is just amazing. So I'm very excited about that um, as well. Thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate all your insight, your presentation, and answering so many questions. If you're curious about more learning opportunities, be sure to check out our upcoming events on our SAA Learn webpage.